All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Eat Sleep Sony discussion. Uh, this week we'll be talking about performance on the different data path methods that we've discussed in class so far. Uh, so for today, I highly recommend that you follow along with the worksheet available uh, wherever you find this video or the slides in our Google Drive. Uh, we're just going to be going through a bunch of practice problems similar to what you might see on homeworks or exams. Um, so we're not going to be really talking about project stuff today. Uh, but as a reminder, we do have upcoming assignments, homework due today, project checkpoint due today, and project three due a couple days after. So be sure that you're on top of that. But we won't really talk about that stuff today. All right. Uh, so to start us off, just uh, straight hot off the iron, uh, we're going to start off with a benchmark, right? And a benchmark is a test program that's supposed to be pretty large and representative of other types of regular programs that we might run on our processor. Uh, so we have a benchmark here uh, that we're saying is uh, going to have similar ratios of instructions to whatever normal things we might run on our processor. So for this benchmark, we have 25% of our 10,000 instructions being LW instructions, 15% being SW, 30% uh, uh, some sort of uh, calculation instruction, uh, Twenty percent branches, and then ten percent that are no ops or halts. And I don't know why we have a bunch of no ops since they're usually pretty pointless, but we have them there uh, just for fun. Um, and so we're going to go through a couple different data paths with this same benchmark, and we're going to calculate the runtime uh, on each data path and rank them all at the end uh, to see uh, kind of where we've come from uh, as we've talked about the different data paths in this class. Uh, so to start us off, uh, we want to know uh, what is our runtime on the single cycle system. And if you remember, uh, in general, our uh, calculation for runtime is going to be the number of instructions uh, times the cycles per instruction uh, times our clock period. And if we know real quick, uh, this part, the number of instructions times cycles per instruction is just the number of total cycles. Uh, so if we have either of those two things, uh, we will we will know uh, what our final runtime will be. And in the single cycle, uh, our CPI is one, meaning that the number of instructions is equal to the number of cycles. Um, so the calculation for this single cycle problem will be our 10,000 instructions times a CPI of one uh, times our clock period, which we need to figure out first. Uh, so first, um, the clock period is going to be the most uh, difficult thing to, comp uh, to calculate only when we're in single cycle. And we have to think back to a couple discussions ago when we were talking about the single cycle processor. Uh, we had that chart that goes through the components used by each of our different uh, instructions. And we have to figure out which one is the longest. And so uh, looking at the instructions that we have, we have our standard LCTK instructions. Um, and so typically our longest are going to be LW or SW. Um, and that's because uh, add and nor uh, use the ALU, uh, which is also used by LW and SW. Uh, and they also write back to the register file, which is uh, done by LW. So LW, uh, if we're thinking sets, uh, has at least as many components used as add and nor. Um, that's the same for BEQ since BEQ uh, reads the register file, just like all those other instructions, and it does an ALU calculation. Uh, the only time a BEQ could take longer than one of the others is if it took a really, really long time to update the PC flip-flop for some reason. Uh, so we're going to assume that that's not a thing, and uh, because we see that everything that's not listed here costs zero nanoseconds. Um, and then knobs and halts definitely aren't going to use as much as any of the other instructions. Uh, so we know to look at LW and SW most of the time to be our longest instructions. And because SW does not write back to the register file, the only time SW would take longer than an LW is if uh, writing to memory took longer than reading from memory and writing to the register file. So since uh, we see that accessing memory is not split up based on reading and writing, um, that means that LW is going to be our longest instruction here. So now we can actually calculate our clock period. All right. 
Um, so an LW is first going to read instruction memory. And so we have a 50 nanosecond delay for that. And then it will read the register file. And here that costs five nanoseconds. Uh, then it'll do an address calculation, which costs 10 nanoseconds. Uh, then it will read from memory again, this time data memory. And then finally, it will write to the register file, which will take an additional five nanoseconds here. And summing that up, we get 120 nanoseconds. And then if we plug that into our clock period over here, uh, that's going to come out to, I believe, uh, uh, 1.2 million nanoseconds, which is equal to 1.2 milliseconds. So that's the runtime that we have for our single cycle. There's all that typed out for you uh, in math. All right. So now uh, that was pretty quick. Uh, so that was some stuff that we did before the midterm, before spring break. Uh, so that hopefully should have been review. Um, and so now we'll move on to the multi-cycle, which should also be review. Um, but remember why we came up with the multi-cycle in the first place. Uh, the, the purpose of the multi-cycle was to partition out uh, the different components and steps that we had in every instruction um, to shave off some of the time uh, for, in, for components that we don't use. So for an add nor, uh, we don't need to access data memory. So in theory, we should be able to shave off those 50 nanoseconds dedicated uh, to accessing memory. Um, but the issue is that now our clock period is going to be constrained by the longest component. And that means that uh, really fast cycles uh, might still take a long time because we're going to normalize our clock period to the longest cycle, right? And so we're going to see that that affects our multi-cycle in this problem. Using the same benchmark, uh, now we have to first figure out how many cycles we had. Because remember from before, uh, we could just take the number of cycles and multiply that by our clock period to get a runtime. Uh, and then we'll figure out the runtime and see if it's better than our single cycle. And as a little bonus, we'll uh, calculate the CPI here. Um, so if we're trying to figure out how many cycles uh, we need to uh, complete a program, we're going to weight each of our instructions by the number of cycles that they take to complete. So um, there's two ways to do this. Either you can uh, you can multiply the 10,000 times a percentage times the number of cycles, um, but I'm going to do it a little different here. Uh, and I'm going to just multiply the straight up number of instructions uh, so that we can see how it works both ways. So if we have 10,000 total instructions, 25% of those are LW. That means we have 2,500 LWs that will each take five cycles. If you remember from our a little state machine that we had for the multi-cycle. And then we'll take our 1500 SWs times the four cycles required for an SW. Uh, then our 3000 ad nors times the four cycles needed for that. And then our 2000 BEQs times the four cycles needed for that one. And then finally, uh, our 1000 no ups and halts. And those only take two cycles. And if we multiply that out, uh, I'm actually not going to do the math by hand since I did it before, it comes out to 40,500 cycles. And so you can see here, uh, we're doing it the other way. So uh, this here just pulls out the 10,000 and then multiplies the percentages explicitly uh, by the number of cycles. Um, and yes. All right, so our total was uh, 40,500 cycles. And by the way, uh, what this uh, parentheses is doing here. Uh, since all of SW, add nor, and BEQ take four cycles, we can just add those up together, do the math there, uh, distribute out the, the four. Um, so that gets us the exact same numbers. So we have uh, that many cycles. So now to figure out our actual execution time, we'll take the longest component, which is our clock period, uh, and that is 50 nanoseconds times the cycle count that we got from the last time. And that's going to come out to that many nanoseconds, over 2 million nanoseconds, uh, which is equal to 2.025 milliseconds. Now, if you remember from before, our single cycle runtime uh, was about 1.2 milliseconds. So we see that this is not better. Uh, in the words of John Mulaney, no, 
it is not better. And so even though we thought that this was pretty good intuition, um, it didn't actually help us. So now we're going to try to figure out something else that we can do uh, to get our runtime as small as possible. Right, and now just for fun, the CPI. So we have our cycle count, which is this 40,500. And we can divide that by our 10,000 instructions, cycles divided by instructions, and we get 4.05. Pretty quick and easy. And so that's a very high number. Uh, we're going to see that go down when we get to the pipeline, uh, but it'll take a little bit to, to get there. Right. Um, and before we move on to the pipeline, uh, I want to do a little bit of theory. And uh, in multi-cycle, we are able to partition things up into multiple cycles. Uh, but what if, if we uh, take, took each instruction and only took the amount of time that we need just for that instruction? Uh, we're going to call this the optimal achievable runtime. And in theory, you could uh, reach this if you had infinite cycles for each instruction uh, that only use part of a component every time. Um, and so in order to do that math, uh, we do have to calculate the, uh, the propagation delay for each individual instruction. So remember for LW, that was 120 nanoseconds. And so for add nor, uh, we're going to add up our components. So we have reading instruction memory, uh, then reading a register file, which is going to happen in all of these instructions besides no open halt. Uh, and then we had our ALU calculation, which happens and again, all these instructions. Uh, and then from there, it kind of branches off. For add nor, we wrote to the register file. For LW, we had to read memory and then write to the register file. For SW, we just wrote to memory. And then for BEQ, we, I guess, just updated the PC, which should take zero time. And so that gives us these varying actual runtimes for each instruction. Um, so if you think about the single cycle, um, this is the time at which the instruction is actually ready to move on to the next instruction. But because of the fixed clock period uh, that, that we have based on our oscillators in our system, uh, we, we do have to wait the full 120 nanoseconds in order to finish that. So now we can uh, do similar to what we did for the multi-cycle and just wait each of those runtimes by the percentage of instructions. So our 2500 LW instructions will take 120 nanoseconds. And then our 1500 SW will take 115 nanoseconds. And same for uh, our ADNORs and our BEQs and our NOPs and HALTs. And that will get us a total of about uh, 0 0.8625 milliseconds, which is about 30% faster than the 1.2 milliseconds that we got on the single cycle. And it's less than half of the two milliseconds that we got for our multi-cycle. So if this is the optimal achievable runtime. Uh, this is like the theoretical limit of what we can reach. Uh, so we're going to try to move towards that. Um, with, with other uh, maybe splitting up uh, our multi-cycle even further, we could get there, uh, reducing that clock period that we had. Um, and, th and there's other tricks that we can do by maybe finding better technologies for components that we can use to get down to that theoretical minimum, right? Um, so that's all the review that we have uh, for the single multi-cycle. And so now I'll actually move on to pipelining and see how this improves our performance uh, to get it to where we actually want it. So before we go into the actual problems, uh, remember a couple of things that we talked about in lecture. So the number of cycles, um, instead of just multiplying uh, and, and weighting each instruction by the uh, number of cycles it took for each instruction based on our little SIT machine, um, we're going to operate more similar to our single cycle and that each instruction is only going to take one cycle, assuming that we don't have any hazards. Uh, and then we do have to add uh, the startup cycles uh, for each of our pipeline stages, except for the right back stage. Um, and that's because uh, we really count how many instructions we complete by how many instructions write back, since that's finishing an instruction, a full completion of an instruction. And so in the first, uh, four cycles on our lecture pipeline, nothing is going to be in the write back stage. And so that means that 
uh, we um, will not complete an instruction there. And so then we just have empty cycles that aren't completing instructions and we have to add them into our cycle count um, for our five stage pipeline. So for this class on the lecture pipeline, uh, the number of cycles will be our number of instructions plus the four startup cycles, and then we'll add in all of our hazards. Right? Uh, so for example, if we have a thousand instructions with no hazards, uh, we get a CPI of about one. Um, and, and that those four startup cycles uh, become negligible as we increase the total number of instructions. So if you have like a billion instructions in this extra point, 004 that we've added on to our CPI gets smaller and smaller until it's really not worth anything to count. Uh, but for now, we'll count it explicitly. And so that gets us a CPI of about one, but never exactly one. Uh, so there's like a limit there if you're thinking of math. I'll actually write it out because it's a little fun. So the limit uh, as the number of instructions approaches infinity of our CPI, assuming no hazards, is one. There we are. All right, so now let's actually get into the problems. So we have the same benchmark, uh, but I am adding a couple qualifications uh, so that we can um, add in some hazards for fun here. Um, so the same percentages of instructions, um, but uh, this time uh, we see that 30% of our LWs are immediately followed by a dependent instruction. So that, that's gonna create a data hazard between an LW and the next instruction. Uh, we have our adnors, um, which don't have anything immediately following that's dependent on the result of the adnor, but we might have a little sandwich going on. So if we have uh, like an adnor, and then we have uh, some other instruction, and then we have a dependent. So that's what's going on here. Um, so that's what it means by 50% of our adnors being followed by a dependent instruction with a non-dependent in between. And this one is non-dependent. I like to call this sandwiching since the non-dependent is sandwiched between our adnor and our dependent instruction, right? And then we have 20% of our BEQs um, and 60% of our BEQs are taken branches, which of course means that 40% are not taken. Um, and then all of our other weights are the same. And now just for fun, uh, let's increase the clock period. Let's um, say that our pipeline registers are adding a 10 nanosecond overhead um, just to make it more realistic. Uh, so in our multi-cycle, our clock period was the longest component, um, but really in the pipeline, our, uh, our clock period is going to be the longest stage. Uh, so the longest cycle and multi-cycle and the longest stage in our pipeline. And uh, we're going to say that that's the memory components, which we have from before, which was 50 nanoseconds, and then say that there's some 10 nanosecond uh, delay in order to update the pipeline registers. So we're going to work with a clock period of 60 nanoseconds, which is this 50 plus 10 nanoseconds. All right. Um, so we're not going to do it just with pipeline. We're going to go through multiple schemes on the pipeline that you might see on homeworks or exams. And we'll see what the runtime is for each of them. So if we start with the strategy that we introduced on the project checkpoint, uh, which is avoidance, um, then that means that we're going to insert no ops into the assembly code before we put it on the processor. And so we have to figure out how many no ops we have to insert um, in order to uh, avoid all these hazards that we discovered uh, when we got the dependency numbers. So uh, by the way, we're using the lecture pipeline, not the project pipeline. Um, so that means that a data hazard will have at most two no ops. Um, and then our, all of our control hazards are going to have three no ops. So when we're doing avoidance, we have to insert a no op, um, or, or rather two no ops for every single uh, data hazard, unless there's one of these sandwich situations. If we have one of these sandwich situations, we only have to insert one no op since this other non-dependent instruction is sort of acting as a buffer, a no-op for us. And so that means that uh, for every single LW that has a dependent instruction, we'll add two no-ops. So here's where we get that math. So we have, you no, know, we have uh, 2,500 LWs and uh, we'll multiply that by 0.3 to get um, the 30% of those LWs. And then we'll add in two no-ops for each of those. 
Similarly, for our add nor, we had uh, 3,000 of those. And we see that 50% have the sandwich situation. So we'll multiply that by 0.5, and then we'll add in one no op because it's a sandwich. Um, and then because we're inserting this into actual code, um, we're going to see that that's going to get added to both the numerator and the denominator for our CPI calculation. So here's the uh, numbers explicitly. And I did forget that we have our BEQs. Uh, right now, we're not worrying about whether or not BEQ is taken, because when we're doing avoidance, we're going to put in our BEQ and then three NOPs immediately afterwards so that we don't need to know if it's taken or not to make sure that we don't execute anything. And so that means that uh, our 10,000, or sorry, our 2,000 BEQs, uh, there's going to be three NOPs for every single one. So that means uh, that we'll add in a total of 6,000 NOPs for our BEQs. And then look up here, we'll have 1,500 uh, for our add NOR. And I think this also comes out to 1,500 for our LW. Right. And here's those numbers popping up there. It's 2,500 times 0.3 times 2 is 1,500. Same for 3,000 times 0.5. And then our 6,000 comes from the 2,000 times 3. All right. So now um, to do our CPI, we first have to figure out our cycles, which was the number of instructions plus our pipeline stages, minus one, uh, and then plus our inserted no-ops. So that's going to be uh, 19,004. And then now that we've inserted all these no-ops into our program, uh, that means that our numerator, or sorry, our denominator is going to add the 9,000 no-ops also. And so we get 19,004 divided by 19,000 to get a CPI of 1.00021, which looks really good. That's almost one, that's kind of what we want. We want to get it as close to one as possible. Um, but let's look at our runtime now. So we take uh, these number of cycles, the 19,004 on top. Um, and so uh, 19,004 times our clock period of 16 nanoseconds comes out to about 1.1 milliseconds. And so if we remember our single cycle uh, going back uh, was 1.2, our multi-cycle was two, and our optimal achievable was about 0.86. So we haven't even reached the minimum that we want, but um, we are doing better than our single cycle, which is what we want. All right. Uh, so that's how we calculate our runtime with avoidance. Um, and so now we're going to move on to uh, detect install. And if you remember, the only difference between avoidance and detect install is that it's the hardware that's inserting those nomes for us instead of the programmer. Uh, but, that, but every single no-op that we inserted into our original code is still going to be inserted by the hardware. So that means that our cycle count this time is going to be the exact same. All right, and so we still have the 9,000 knobs that we had. We still have the 19,004 cycles, but this time we're not adding those 9,000 knobs on the bottom of the fraction. Um, and, and we're just keeping the original 10,000 instructions. And that gets us a CP of 1.9004. Uh, and then to actually calculate our runtime, which is the number of cycles times our clock period. Well, the number of cycles again, hasn't changed. So it's going to be the same at 1.1 milliseconds. So the key to note here is that the runtime was the same, the cycles were the same, but the CPIs were different. Um, and we, we thought that the CPI of 1.00 something looked really good, um, but it was actually misleading because we had all these inserted no-ops uh, that really don't change the behavior of our program. They just make it look like it's running super efficiently when our runtime is just the same. And, and it's consuming a lot of power also when we insert or when we uh, keep all those no-ops in our memory. So um, our runtime is going to be 1.1 milliseconds. All right. And uh, as we said before, this is going to be just barely better than a single cycle, but still not uh, our theoretical minimum for a multi-cycle processor. So let's move on um, and see if we can improve this. So now let's say that we are still using detect install for our control hazards. 
So remember from before that we inserted 6,000 NOPs for control. So I'll keep my NOP count on the side. So we had 6,000 for control hazards. But now that we're using detect and forward on the lecture pipeline for data hazards, we're going to eliminate most of the data hazard NOPs that we had inserted before. And so anything with that sandwich situation is no longer going to require um, a, uh, a stall. Uh, the only time that we'll have to insert a NOP now is when we have an LW immediately followed by dependent instruction. And this time it will be just one NOP instead of two. And if we remember the reason why, uh, it's because um, the data available from a LW will be available at the end of the MEM stage which means that it can use, be used by the instruction in the next cycle uh, forwarded to the EX stage. So if we have a dependent instruction in the EX stage, that means we need our LW to be in the right back stage and we need a NOOP in the MEM stage itself. And so that's where that one NOOP comes from. So now we just take our number of NOOPs, which was 2,500, uh, and we'll multiply that by the uh, percentage of LWs followed by dependent. And then now we're multiplying by one NOP instead of two. And this comes out to 750 NOPs that we'll insert for data hazards. And those are the only NOPs we'll insert for data hazards. So again, the math, uh, we'll add that all up again to get this total 6,750 NOPs uh, inserted for hazards. And then we'll only add that to the top this time and not the bottom. So we get a total cycle count of 16,754. We'll divide that by our 10,000 instructions to get a CPI of about 1.7. And once again, we just take the number of cycles and multiply by our clock period to get a runtime of about a million nanoseconds, which is a millisecond. And so this is better than our detect install pipeline, uh, but really by only about like 9%. So it really hasn't done us much good to eliminate all these data hazards. Um, it's made it a little faster, but we see that most of the NOPs that we've inserted are coming from these control hazards. So we want to figure out if we can eliminate those somehow, because uh, that's what's really going to boost our performance here. Because uh, the NOPs from our control hazards alone are taking about uh, a little over a third of our runtime. If we see the ratio of the 6,000 to the 16,000. So let's see if we can eliminate that. All right. Okay, um, so most of the time in this class and for the project, uh, we're going to fix the control hazards by doing speculate and squash. So we're going to speculatively execute instructions. And then uh, if they were supposed to be executed, we'll just let them go through the pipeline. Uh, but if they weren't supposed to be executed, we'll squash them and go the other direction, uh, take that branch. Um, and so this is what's called predicting not taken since you just let um, you assume that the branch is not going to be taken and let the instructions immediately following the branch flow into the pipeline. And so um, we do have other schemes that we'll talk about in a minute, uh, but this will hopefully eliminate a good chunk of the uh, those inserted NOPs that we had in detect install for control hazards. So now um, our data hazard NOPs are going to be the same since this is only going to affect our control hazards. Um, and now, instead of multiplying every single BEQ by three NOPs, we're only going to multiply the number of mispredicted branches by those three NOPs. And those three NOPs are not going to be inserted anymore. They're going to be overriding squashed instructions. So we'll take our 2000 BEQs, multiply that by 60%, and that will get us uh, 4,350 NOPs for control hazards. So we've only shaved off uh, about like 1,800 or so, uh, 1,400, and uh, actually 2,400. And uh, now we can put that in our numerator again. And now we have a CPI of 1.4, which is down from 1.7. Uh, but still, we see that our no ops from hazards are taking almost a third of our runtime. But uh, multiplying our total number of cycles by 60 nanoseconds again, this time we get 0.86 milliseconds, uh, which is pretty good. And that's pretty close to what we previously thought was theoretically possible 
that optimal achievable runtime was also about at 0.8 seconds. All right, so now we're going to take a brief tangent uh, to look at other methods of branch prediction and then see if we can use them uh, to improve our total runtime even more. Uh, so we just talked about this idea that we use in the projects at least, uh, where we predict that a branch is not going to be taken and then only branch and squash if it is actually taken. And so um, this is a pretty decent prediction just because of how for loops and while loops and if statements work. Um, but sometimes it can just be dead wrong. And so we want to uh, figure out if there's other ways that we can predict branches better. Um, this does provide some complications um, if we predict something besides not taken. Um, because if we're ever going to predict that a branch is taken, well, we need to know where it's going to branch to. And we won't be able to know that until in our pipeline, the execute stage, where uh, we do that PC plus one plus offset calculation for the first time. Um, in theory, we could move that to the decode stage, but uh, we, we won't do that for our pipeline. Um, and so we're going to introduce a couple extra components uh, to keep track of these things for us. Uh, so because every BEQ, um, when, if you hit that BEQ multiple times, it's going to branch the same place, we can add uh, address tables. Um, I, I forget the exact acronym, it's like a BAT, if I remember right, a branch address table. Um, and so the very first time a BEQ instruction goes to the pipeline, uh, we won't be able to predict that it's taken, but the next time we could predict that it's taken uh, if we remember the target that it goes to. Um, other things that we have trouble with, um, uh, because these BATs have to be of a fixed size, uh, they can only hold so many BEQs. So uh, it, it sort of looks like a cache, if you've gotten to that in lecture yet where we can only keep some of our BEQs in the BAT, and then we have to evict them if we need to make space for others. Uh, so sometimes we can't predict branches that taken and have to predict as not taken, which is why uh, we find it easier in this class to just always predict not taken. Um, and that's because we, we can always know what PC plus one is just based on PC. We don't have to know if it's a branch or what the branch target is to go to PC plus one. But um, let's look at some of the schemes that we could use if we ever wanted to uh, selectively predict branches as taken. Um, so we can do this statically. Uh, we, can, we can say um, that we're just going to have a constant policy uh, maybe like the project, we always predict that a branch is not taken. Uh, maybe we always predict that the branch is taken. So except for that first time, uh, we'll just hold that branch target. And then when we see the PC of the BEQ go through our fetch stage, on the next cycle, we'll update the PC to be that branch target. And so that'd be an always taken scheme. Uh, we can also do this other scheme where we uh, where we kind of look at our loops and see that our if statement conditionals for the loop or tests happen at the beginning and they would branch past the while loop if they're taken. And then um, that, that will only happen at the end of the loop. So we're going to predict that most of the time those statements are not going to be taken. But because it's a loop, it's always going to go back to go check that condition. And so we can predict those taken. And so we can come up with a scheme where we uh, check the offset field of the BEQ. If it's negative, we know it's going backwards. And so we'll just predict that that's taken since it's going back. And if it's a positive or zero offset, then we'll predict that it's not taken. And so uh, we can use this policy to really, really optimize our while and for loops and possibly even our if statements. Um, but this is all statically because it's a constant policy. Um, and then there's other things that we can do by adding components to a processor, um, which are called predictors. And, and these, are, these are dynamic as opposed to static because they update actually in the processor every time a BEQ is taken or not taken. Uh, so we, we might have something called a last time predictor or a one bit branch predictor, uh, where we guess that the next branch is going to do the exact same thing that it did last time. 
Uh, and so we'll just keep track. We might say um, we have this one bit flip flop in our processor where zero represents not taken and one represents taken. And in the fetch stage, anytime we come across a BEQ, um, we'll just check this bit to see if we should branch the target or if we should just increment PC plus one, uh, depending on if this bit is a one or a zero. And so this is what the state machine might look like for one of these uh, branch predictors. Um, so because it updates to whatever it was last time, uh, if it was predicted not taken and it's actually not taken, then we'll just predict that it's not taken the next time following this red arrow here. And if it's actually taken, well, we'll just move the bit so that it's predicted taken the next time. Again, if it's actually taken and it was predicted taken, we'll just stay it there, leave it there, that is. Otherwise, if it was actually not taken, we'll just move into the state where we predict the next one will not be taken. Um, so if you look at this pattern that we have, um, so if we have um, some predictor that's initialized to not taken, which is common because uh, like I was saying, we can't take a branch the first time speculatively until it reaches that offset calculation. So it might be predicted not taken at the beginning, Oh, but then if it's taken, then it was mispredicted, and next time it'll be predicted taken. But what if it's not taken the next time? So that means we have a mispredict. It'll be predicted not taken the next time, and then taken again, and so on and so on. And we would get a 0% accuracy uh, for our branch predictor. And that would mean that we would have to squash instructions every single time we have a BEQ, which would get us back to practically just detect and install, which is not what we want. So let's see if we can do better. Uh, we might upgrade to a two-bit branch predictor, um, which uh, is, is also called a saturated uh, predictor, um, where it will be affected by whatever the branch did last time, but it's really based on whatever the branch did the last two times. So if you have a branch that um, only is taken every so often, then that means that it will be not taken the rest of the time and predicted not taken uh, pretty much every time. So let's look at the finite state machine for this one. Um, we might start off uh, in a weekly not taken state. And so by the way, we can represent these with, uh, with numbers, two-bit numbers going from zero to three, uh, representing each of our states. So we might start off in state one we're predicting that it's not taken or weakly not taken. Um, and so our actual prediction will be not taken. Uh, but if it is correct, then we'll move into strongly not taken for the next time, state zero. And if it was actually taken, we'll move into weakly taken. And then uh, looking at the other states, um, if you're in a strong state, either taken or not taken, if it's a mispredict, it'll just move to that weak state. Uh, so we're still guessing the same thing, but not as confident the next time. Um, and so that's how that one works. Now, if we have our same sequence as before, the T and T and T and T, uh, what if we start in weekly not taken? So if uh, it's start off at, at weekly not taken and it's actually taken, then it will move to state uh, weekly taken. But if it's not taken, then I'll also mispredict again and go back down to weekly not taken. Then if it's taken again, it will move back to weekly taken. And I'll do that again and again and again. And once again, we get a 0% uh, success rate, a 100% mispredict rate. But that's pretty uncommon. We're going to expect that our branches are actually going to do something different. And so we'll, we'll guess that it's going to be a pretty good idea to use a two-bit branch predictor. Uh, one final thing with the branch predictors, uh, we can um, really have two options. We can either have a global predictor that uses just one or two bits for every single branch, or we can allocate these predictors on a per branch level. So we're thinking about the BAT that I was talking about before. It might look something like this, where we keep track of the branches PC, its target, and then we also might have a predictor field. And we would repeat that for all the branches that we come across. We might have to cache them a little bit in evict, um, but we would store that right with our, our little lookup table for the BDQ. 
And so this would allow us to uh, predict on an individual level with respect to BQ. So if you have, for example, one if statement that's pretty much always taken, and then another if statement that pretty much never is taken, then we could predict each of them uh, correctly most of the time without having them affect each other. And that would be a pretty good scheme for uh, a branch predictor. Uh, if you want to learn more about these branch predictors, uh, we might actually have situations where these two if statements are affecting each other in terms of uh, predictability. And so you can go take uh, EECS 470, which spends a good amount of time on branch predictors. And uh, we have some uh, which will do some like, uh, like modulo operations between a global branch predictor and a local branch predictor. And it might uh, use a hash map to figure out what our target should be and all these cool things. Uh, but for this class 370, we're going to stick with uh, our global and local and then our one bit and our two bit branch predictors along with our static branch predictors. So let's uh, do a practice problem to see all these schemes real quick. Uh, so let's look at the spec that we used for project one. Uh, and if you remember, this spec was uh, translatable to C code in the following way. Um, I think, let's see, I think it was like four, uh, some int, I'll call it uh, register one is five. Um, and then uh, register one is not equal to zero. And then we'll decrement register one each time. Uh, so this starter code, the starter assembly code that we had in project one was translatable to this C code. And so we'll see that uh, this, this uh, little loop here will go five times. And um, we're going to look at primarily the two BEQs that we have to control this loop. Uh, one does the condition check and one does uh, the, the looping back up to the top. And we'll see how our different predictors can handle each of them. So before we start, um, I do want to look at this assembly code and I want to look at our actual sequences of what's taken and not taken before we see what our uh, predictors are. Uh, so if we look at the two BEQs, uh, this top one uh, is conditional um, in that it's going to be taken sometimes and not taken other times. But if we look at the bottom one, uh, whatever the contents of register zero are, they're always going to be equal to the contents of register zero. So this is an unconditional branch, which means that it's always taken. Um, so knowing that our loop runs five times, this means that the top BQ is going to be not taken uh, for the first four times in the loop, and then it's going to be taken the last time, which means that it'll skip over the unconditional BEQ the last time to go down to, uh, let's see, the done label. And then uh, for all four times that our unconditional is run, it'll be taken. So our pattern looks something like this. So, so for the top BEQ, uh, we have a not taken, not taken, not taken, not taken, taken pattern. And then for the bottom, uh, we just have four takens. So um, if we use something that's static, uh, like um, not taken, like we use in the project, uh, that means that we'll mispredict all these Ts. And we have five Ts, so we'll mispredict each of those. We have nine total. So we'll get a five out of nine mispredict rate if we predict not taken every time. Uh, and assuming that we had some sort of magic to where we already had the branch target, uh, let's say that we predict taken and we don't have to worry about the first time that the BEQ enters our pipeline. Uh, if we predict taken, then that means we'll get a four and nine mispredict ratio. Uh, so these four ends that we have out of all nine will be mispredicted. Uh, so for this particular program, it would be better to predict taken every time compared to not taken. Let's look at some others that we have. Um, I don't have a slide for this, but if we uh, predict um, if we predict uh, not taken for forward uh, branches, like we were talking about a minute ago, um, and predict taken for backward, uh, that would mean that we would get it right almost every time. Because uh, the only time we would mispredict would be the last of the top BEQ, because um, it would predict not taken for these first four that are actually not taken. 
And then the bottom unconditional, which branches back here, uh, would be predicted taken every time. And so for this, we would get an, uh, let's see, an eight and nine uh, success rate, which means a one in nine mispredict rate. So that's pretty good for us. Let's look at some of the dynamic branch predictors that we could come up with if my slide will advance. All right. Um, so if we have um, a one bit predictor, um, it's going to probably be initialized to not taken, uh, like we said before. And so looking again at our sequence, uh, the top BQ had four not takens and then taken. Um, but um, if we do it locally, at least, uh, that means that these first four are going to be predicted correctly. And the last taken one will be predicted incorrectly. Um, and then we'll have uh, for our unconditional, a separate predictor that will predict not taken the first time. It'll be wrong, so mispredict there, but then it'll be predicted taken for the rest. And so in total, we only have two mispredicts out of nine BEQs that we execute. And so that's pretty good. Not as good as the last static one that we had where we predict taken for forward and not taken for backward, but it's still pretty good. Um, Let's look at a global one next. Um, so the global, um, in order to figure out the predict rate for the global one, we're going to have to interleave our, uh, our different takens and not takens. So that means that we'll have a sequence like not taken, taken, not taken, taken, not taken, taken, not taken, taken. And then the last one will be taken. And this last one is the top BQ. All the other takens are the bottom one, and all the other not takens are the top one. So if we have a two bit global predictor that's initialized to weakly not taken, after seeing that this first branch is weakly or it is not taken, we're going to move to strongly not taken. So I'll, we'll start off with state one, which is weakly not taken. We'll move to state zero, which is strongly not taken. Then we'll see that the next branch is taken. So we'll move back to weakly not taken. Then we again have uh, moving back to strong and then weak and then strong and then weak. Um, and then uh, let's see, I think I actually messed up here. Oh, no. Uh, we'll move back to weak once more and then strong. And you can't see it because my video strong and then the last one uh, would move us to weakly taken but that's not going to affect on the branch so that means that our two-bit predictor is ultimately just going to predict not taken every single time and so that means that we'll mispredict all the taken branches there are five of them and so that's how we get a mispredict rate of five and nine so as we can see the global predictors even if we're using a better technology of predictor um, our global predictor is still not going to really help us because we have these separate BQs that are constantly going back and forth from each other. Uh, so in total, I think our best, uh, our best uh, predictor was the static predictor. We predicted uh, yes uh, for backwards branches and no uh, for forwards branches because that had the mispredict rate of one in nine. Right. Um, Let's see. We do have one more scheme that we might be able to do. Um, noticing that the BEQ is, uh, the BEQ00 is unconditional because the two register indices are the same. Mm -hmm. We might add in some component in our processor where we could check for that. Um, and that would mean that we would never mispredict an unconditional branch. And we could use some other scheme to get down to only one mispredict for our top BEQ that was conditional. And so we could use that to get another uh, mispredict rate of one in nine. Um, so that's everything I have on predictors. Let's see how that actually affects our performance. So with the same benchmark as before, uh, we're now going to assume that we can somehow predict every branch correctly. So this is similar to our optimal achievable runtime from before. So that was only theoretically possible. Now it's only theoretically possible to predict every branch correctly. 
which means we have no control hazard BEQs, and we only have to insert the 750 knobs from our detect and forward data hazards. And so then we'll have 750 total. Uh, we'll have uh, 10,754 cycles, which gets us a CPI of close to one, which is pretty good, and a runtime of 0.65 milliseconds. So ranking all these together, uh, we can see that uh, our perfect prediction was obviously the best, um, but even with the normal scheme that we use for project three, just predicting not taken from branches and uh, using detect and forward for our data hazards, we were able to get a slightly better runtime than what we thought previously was theoretically possible. Uh, so we can see that pipelining is helping us with our performance. And uh, there's still places to go in order to get it to be better. Uh, if you wanna learn more about um, what we do, uh, even if we're not looking at uh, better branch predictors, but just like similar to pipelining, how we just came up with a completely new idea based on the previous ideas, you can go take EECS 470. And so EECS 470 uh, will teach you mostly about out of order, I uh, can't spell out of order processing, um, where instead of putting things through a pipeline, you put them in variable order to eliminate as many data hazards as possible and execute the instructions that would create data hazards at a later time and finish up the other ones first. And so in theory, that should make our processing time better. Uh, it just means that um, our, our cost for uh, mispredicting a branch gets much, much higher with out of order. So if you want to take EX470, uh, you'll learn about that. You'll also learn about branch predictors, uh, multi-core systems, um, and, and other things. Uh, I would highly recommend it. That's everything that I have for today. Um, good luck on the homeworks, and be sure to practice these problems in preparation for the exam. And we'll see you next time.